Good morning, church. Welcome to Liberty. We're excited to worship with you this morning. Stand with me as we uh, begin our worship service this morning. Psalm 135, 3 through 6. Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Celebrate his lovely name with music. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel for his own special treasure. I know the greatness of the Lord, that our Lord is greater than any other God. The Lord does whatever pleases him throughout all heaven and earth and on the seas and in their depths. Uh, this morning, we're going to start with the, with the song King of Kings. Um, and as we sing, I just encourage you to prepare your hearts and minds. Let's give great worship to our Lord and Savior this morning. from their tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of all shall not kneel shall not fail
Father, prepare our hearts and minds for, for the word as it's preached today. And Lord, we, um, we all come from, from different corners of Pella and the area, Lord, if, with different things in our lives that are happening. And we just want to present those things to you as we sing about the goodness of God. Lord, you are so good. And we are here to worship you. And we just pray that you will receive that. We pray for your Holy Spirit upon us that you might be glorified this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. seated 
Jesus. Dale comes and prays for us. Good morning. Welcome again to Liberty. It's great to see you all this morning. I have the privilege of leading us in family prayer this morning. Um, I'm Dale Hodge, one of our elders. Um, as I was reflecting this morning on the, the first song we sang, uh, King of Kings, a couple verses popped out, and I wanted to share with them with you and, and just let you meditate on them as we begin our prayer time. First one is from Psalm 24, uh, verses 9 and 10. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Another one, 1 Timothy 6, 15 and 16. God, the blessed and only ruler, the King of kings and Lord of lords, who alone is immortal and who lives in unapproachable light, whom no one has seen or can see, to him be the glory and might forever. Amen. Isn't it awesome that we serve and we know the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Um, even when things around us are just hard and just don't seem right, we can rest in knowing the King of kings and Lord of lords says that he holds us in his hands. So let's pray this morning as a family. Father, we lift your name high. We praise you and we thank you for your greatness. Lord, it's, it's amazing that you would want relationship with us and you seek after us, Lord, but you do and, and you want to redeem us, Lord. And we just thank you for the salvation that we can only receive through you. Lord, I pray that you would uh, continue to be moving through this service, that the Holy Spirit would search us and would um, help our hearts to hear the things we need to hear. Father, I lift up the, the middle schoolers, Pastor Rob, all the leaders that are going on their annual camping trip this coming this weekend. And Lord, I just pray that this would be a time where they could bond, where new friendships could form, where relationships could grow, that they could spur each other on to continue to grow in their faith. Lord, I also lift up the upcoming men's meeting that you would help men to think of it, make it a priority, that they would come seeking to uh, grow closer to you with their brothers in Christ and that we could just band together to be the men that you've called us to be. Um, I, feel, I pray that it would be a rich time of challenge and fellowship. Um, also lift up the speaker, Paul Bauman, as he comes, Lord. Lord, in the time leading up to um, the men's meeting, this, I pray that you would help him to be able to uh, hear from the Spirit what you would have for him to bring, that he would be able to uh, search and find what exactly you would have for us. Lord, there's, there's lots of other needs within the Liberty Body. Um, a few that think of are, are Betty Carlson, and as she's having a cochlear implant um, tomorrow, Lord, that you would allow that surgery to go well, that when it's time to, to try it, that there would be uh, hearing and that her quality of life would be able to be approved significantly by that. And we just praise you for the, the miracle that is that, that surgery. Lord, I lift up Emily Turner also um, with her pregnancy and, and dealing with kidney stones. And I just pray that you would help them to be re able to remove them and also protect her and protect the baby and um, that you would, your hand would just be on, on them as well as the doctors. Lord, I lift up Connie Milligan as she's recovering from um, a, a procedure in her back. I pray that you would uh, grant her a speedy recovery and that your, your hand of comfort and would be upon her. Lord, I also lift up Shane Byer and family, Lord, that you would continue to give wisdom and guidance to doctors and specialists um, as they decide what they can do. And Lord, I just pray that you would work in his body, that you would, um, you would do a miracle in his body, Lord. Lord, I pray that you, you would also be with Jessica and their baby and and just, I just pray that you would lift up, that you would hold that family in your hands, that you would protect them. Lord, I also lift up Kay Landon 
um, as she is um, in Japan right now for an event that Dave was supposed to lead and speak at, Lord, it's, it's going to be a tough time of, of remembering, but also a good time of, of being able to see who all he was able to impact in the position in his life that you had given him. Lord, I pr pray for continued strength and comfort for them in these months following Dave's passing, Lord, that you would just um, give them a peace that, does, that is, is beyond understanding. Lord, we again lift up this morning. Thank you for the ability to come here and worship you. We lift up our praises to you, and as we continue to sing, pray that you would prepare our hearts for the message to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Stand with us again as we uh, continue our time in worship. I see the work of your hands and galaxies spinning a heavenly dance. Oh God, all oh that you are is so overwhelming. And I hear the sound of your voice all at once. It's a gentle and thundering noise. Oh God. All that you are is so overwhelming. And I delight myself in you, captivated by your beauty. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into your cross forgiven and free and forever you'll be my God all that you've done is so overwhelming I delight myself in you in the glory of your presence I'm overwhelmed I'm overwhelmed beautiful you are beautiful oh god there is no one more beautiful you are beautiful god you are the most beautiful you are wonderful you are wonderful oh god there is no one more wonderful you are wonderful you are the most wonderful you are glorious you are glorious oh god there is no one more glorious you are glorious god you are the most glorious I delight myself in you, in the glory of your presence. I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you. God, I run into 
to your arms Unashamed because of mercy I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you and I'm overwhelmed, I'm overwhelmed by you Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are overwhelmed. We're overwhelmed by your glory. We're overwhelmed by your holiness. We're overwhelmed by your justice. We're overwhelmed by your love. We're overwhelmed by your mercy. We're overwhelmed by your grace. We're overwhelmed by your omnipotence. We're overwhelmed by your omniscience. Lord, you are God. And you are the only God. And so we gather here today to exalt you, to praise you, and to treasure you. Open our hearts and our minds, Holy Spirit, to your word. Open our hearts and our minds, Holy Spirit, to how you want to do that surgical task in our hearts and minds. And Lord, may we be open and willing and available to be your servants, and to live for your glory. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. For those of you who are new, or those of you who are 60 and older and have a short, don't have that long-term memory anymore, uh, I'm Dane Shout. I'm one of the pastors here. Uh, for those of you who are visitors, I've not been here for a few weeks uh, because I've been on, on vacation and um, and so just uh, one of the first vacations that uh, my whole family, we're empty nesters, we have four children. Uh, one of the first times our whole family's been on vacation together for several years. And so it was truly a, a blessing. And I'm not going to bore you with a, a lot of uh, details, but um, a couple of interesting things took place. First of all, it's one of those trips where 36 hours before we had left, we had to get the COVID test. And so here's six of us with you know, tabs up our noses at Walgreens, and um, we need to have these results real quick. And so we go back to our daughter's house who lives in Chicago, and we wait. And all of a sudden, an email comes to my daughter, and she says, Dad, and I've got one son, Colin, you're negative. Yes, we get to go. Who cares about the rest of you? Huh? <laughs> and then about 20 minutes later, Child number one, child number two, child number four, you're negative. Men, do not say this to your wife, who at that point in time was the only one who had not received the results. Do not say this. Well, honey, there's a lot of fun things to do in Chicago. About a half hour later, fear, trepidation, sweating, she's negative. So we actually got to go. And um, that is actually a place that we, uh, one of the places that we stood, uh, Croatia, Dubrovnik, across several hundred, hundreds of feet above the city of Dubrovnik. However, below in the city of Dubrovnik is this huge ancient castle, which is where Game of Thrones was filmed. You know, and I'm such a huge fan of Game of Thrones. I looked to my daughter and I said, so was that a movie or was that a TV show? Dad, it starred so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so and so-and-so. Didn't know a single one of them. So uh, anyway, I just enjoyed the history of it and, and all of that. But, uh, um, and uh, we are still waiting for our luggage. We got back on Tuesday. It's somewhere between Frankfurt and Montreal and Chicago. So we've been told six pieces of luggage. So 
Thanks to Adam Houts and uh, George Blom, Randy Shile, who filled in uh, both in the pulpit and uh, for communion while I was gone. Um, Adam Houts, uh, thank you. Um, he's uh, getting ready to, uh, to head overseas here in a few weeks and uh, approached him and said, hey, I'm going to be on vacation about a month in advance, and would you be willing to preach? And uh, he said, well, I'll, I'll think about it. And I said, well, while you're thinking about it, just realize this, if you don't preach, we're going to end our funding for your missions, all right? So, so no pressure, no pressure, but uh, yeah, but it was a good incentive, wasn't it? Yeah, so anyway, want to uh, draw your attention. We have uh, three really key events. We've got a lot of stuff going on at Liberty. Some of those happen weekly, monthly, but these are three key events that you really need to mark your calendar for. Men, men's meeting. What's the men's meeting? Well, when we hired Pastor Rob several years ago, we informed the congregation that our youth pastor had a smoking problem. He had a smoking problem, um, smoking meat. And over the years, including myself, we have become disciples. Um, and we've gotten a whole bunch of people that have smokers. Men's meeting is basically a huge gathering of men where we smoke a whole bunch of meat and we have sweet corn and potatoes and dessert. And so we feed you good and then we bring in someone uh, to speak um, uh, from outside that uh, has been an influence. So the one this year spoke at the men's retreat at Hidden Acres a couple years ago. And I had more than one person come up to me and say, we need to get this person at Liberty. So he'll be preaching on Sunday morning to everybody, and then he'll be preaching uh, at our men's meeting. So you, men, you want to do that? Be in prayer. Who can I invite? This is one event in our church where I would say the most number of guests show up for, um, just because our men um, invite people. And so be asking yourself, praying, uh, who can I invite? September 23rd, 24th. We don't do this every year. We don't do this every two years. We don't do this every four years. We're doing a major visionary family conference here. It's on a Friday evening, Saturday morning. So basically, carve that time away. Get those babysitters set up because we want you to be a part of this visionary family conference. We're, we're bringing in an, an individual um, who travels all over the country and the world um, basically, this is all he does, is he does these visionary family conferences. And so, um, just mark down your college. And then October 28 and 30, Engage Global. Uh, we're going to head up uh, with a group of 15 or 20 of us to, to Minneapolis. And this ministry basically um, teaches you a little bit about God's heart for the world, but also gets you out into a couple of uh, places um, um, where you can be exposed uh, to other nationalities, and uh, uh, basically it's just going to be a great... Um, for those of you who have taken Perspectives or the Journey course, this is a perfect next step. Perfect next step. Or dads, moms, take one of your high school students, one of your high school kids with you. Give them a, a wider vision of what's out there and what they're going to be experiencing, especially if they go uh, to college in the future. So anyway, mark those uh, dates down. Uh, the men's meeting, there's actually a table out in the lobby where you can sign up. Um, there's, there's posters for the first two events. Uh, you can look at the QR code and you can register with that as well. Okay, let's pray and then we're going to dig into God's Word. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your Word. We thank you that it number one, exposes us to who you are and what you have done regarding salvation for your people. Lord, it describes to us who Jesus is. It describes to us how we are to interact with Christ, how are we to live as brothers and sisters together. And so open our minds, open our hearts to your word. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. If you brought your Bibles, go ahead and... Uh, or Bible app, go ahead and uh, open it up to Matthew chapter 8. Matthew chapter 8. Um, we're in the midst of a series. We took a couple weeks off because of guest uh, preachers, but uh, we're in the midst of a series where basically we're going through Matthew chapter 8, Matthew chapter 9, Matthew chapter 10. Last summer we went Matthew chapter 1 through 7, which included 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. 
And uh, we, we are still in Matthew chapter 8. And this is one, if you went to Sunday school growing up, and these, it's a very familiar passage where Jesus calms the storm. Jesus calms the storm. In fact, take a look at what it says. Matthew chapter 8, verses, uh, beginning with verse 23. It says, as he, Jesus, got into the boat, his disciples followed him. So you got the disciples and Jesus in a boat. And suddenly a violent storm arose on the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. But Jesus kept sleeping. So the disciples came and woke him up and they said, Lord, save us. We're going to die. And Jesus said to them, Why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith. Then he got up and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. Go to any typical devotion, a women's devotion, men's devotion, general devotion, on this passage, and here's what you will likely see written. This passage teaches us that when you're going through the storms of life, Jesus will calm those storms. That's not the point of this passage. The point of this passage and the reality of it is Jesus and God doesn't always calm the storm. I've got a storm in my marriage. I've got a storm at work. I've got a storm with children. I've got a storm with a health issue. Sometimes Jesus doesn't calm that storm. So that's problem number one. But the main problem is, is that's not the main point of this true story. And so you see the title of my sermon, Jesus Calms the Storm. What is it supposed to really teach us? Well, the good thing about this one is Matthew tells us in verse 27. In verse 27, Matthew says, here's the main point of why I wrote this true story and recorded it. Verse 27, the men were amazed and asked, what kind of man is this? That even the winds and the sea obey him. See, starting in Matthew chapter 8 and going on through 9 and part of 10, Matthew has a very real and definite purpose in story after story after true story. And the purpose of this is to hold a banner high and say, let me describe to you who Jesus is. And let me describe to you that he has ultimate absolute authority. And so in Matthew chapter 8, it's basically a, a chapter on the authority of Jesus. Verses 1 through 4, as we go through that, a man is cleansed of leprosy. Jesus has the authority to heal diseases. Verses 5 through 13, a centurion comes up to him and says, my servant is paralyzed and ill, and if you would come to my house and heal him, and Jesus says, I don't have to come to your house. And look at the last uh, verse 13. Then Jesus told the servant, Go as you have believed, let it be done for you. And his servant was healed that very moment. So Jesus not only has the authority to heal, but a whole authority to heal even when he's not in proximity. His omnipresence. And then verses 28 through 30, which is after this passage we're looking at, Jesus basically commands the demons, Go. And they obey him. And the demons identify him as you, O son of God. And Jesus says to the demons, go. And even the demons obey him. And so basically, this passage is one more true story about Jesus. And in this case, Jesus not only has authority to heal, 
Jesus not only has authority over demons, Jesus has authority over nature. The ability to calm the sea and to calm the winds with just a word. That's the main point. Those of you who have been to the men's retreat know there's all sorts of fun activities when we go to the men's retreat. We have two major events here at this church for men. One's the men's meeting in August, and then in January, we go to our district camp, join about four or 500 other men for our district men's retreat. Um, I've been there for um, 20-some straight years because I've seen it impact my life, and I've seen it impact so many other lives. But there's all sorts of activities at the men's retreat. You know, you've got hatchet throwing, you've got archery, you've got target practice. I mean, there's just all sorts of testosterone promoting games there. Now, for those who are a little lighter in nature and don't want to get as intense, this next slide will show you they also have what's called a nail pounding contest. They bring in this huge log. They, ha they have to use an end loader to get the thing in. And basically have about uh, two and a half, three inch nails that they've just tapped a little bit into this huge log. And then they give them hammers. On one end of the hammer is a big wide part of the hammer, but on the other part of the hammer is this little teeny sliver of a hammer. And the contest is you got four guys just like that. You've got one chop. And then the next person. And the thing is, is as you go around, the per first person to drive the nail all the way down is the winner. And then they go to the next round. You think that's easy? <laughs> Wrong song, Donkey Kong. <laughs> Try it sometimes with that little hammer. Okay. What Matthew is trying to do in Matthew 8, get this, is pound into our heads. Jesus is ultimate authority. And he uses this story and several others in Matthew 8 to make that point. That is the point of this passage. He's trying to pound into our minds the authority of Jesus, that Jesus is this Messiah, that Jesus is the Savior, that Jesus is God in the flesh. The focus of this passage is not on my storms that I'm having in life. We're going to get to that. But the main point of the passage is this Jesus is God in the flesh. You see, these disciples... They were good Jewish disciples, and they knew their Old Testaments. And they knew from that Old Testament that only God, the Yahweh of the Old Testament, is able to direct the wind and the waves and calm storms. They had read Psalm 89.9 that says, You rule the raging sea. When it waves surge, you still them. They knew Psalm 107.29 where the psalmist announces, The Lord stilled the storm to a murmur and the waves of the sea were hushed. And many other passages that basically said the Lord is reigns over nature. And so Jesus' disciples marveled because they began to realize that this man sitting in the boat who spoke one word, this is God in the flesh. The point of the story is Jesus is God in the flesh. The authority that belongs to God is the same authority that belongs to Jesus. Now, after making that point, I want you to realize that that's the main point of the passage, but there is a wonderful, wonderful promise. So the point of the passage is, yes, all authority that belongs to God is the same authority that belongs to Jesus. But there's also a promise of this story. And the promise of this story is this. Whatever storm you are experiencing, God promises that his presence and his power will be with you. 
that no matter what kind of storm you're going through, God's presence and his power are always with you. You see, in verses 25 and 26, the disciples receive a good tongue lashing. Kids, sometimes it's good for your parents to get in your face when they know that you're not going in the right direction. That's what about being a parent. Your parent's not supposed to be your best friend. In this case, Jesus gives his disciples good tongue lashing. He, they, they need to understand what's going on here. Verse 24, suddenly a violent storm rose in the sea so that the boat was being swamped by the waves. Jesus kept sleeping, so the disciples came and woke him up saying, Lord, save us, we are going to die. And then verse 26, he said, Jesus said to them, why are you so afraid, you of little faith? Then he got up, rebuked the winds, and there was a great calm. What Jesus is trying to say is, I am right here in this boat with you. Why are you so afraid? You've seen me heal diseases. You've seen me say to demons, go, and they go. I'm in this boat with you. Why are you freaking out so badly? What does Jesus mean when he says, you of little faith? I don't think that describes you have no faith at all. It's not a quantity kind of faith. I think that their main problem when Jesus says, you of little faith, is that fear had caused a paralysis in them. They had gotten so afraid that they had forgotten who was in the boat with them. So it's not referring to a quantity of faith. You have little faith. I mean, you, you have just this little much because Jesus said if you have the faith of a mustard seed. But instead, that the circumstances that they found themselves in redirected their mind and their, their, their fears to the circumstances and away from Jesus. Their, their fear drove out their faith. So the real issue here is their failure to fully understand who this Jesus is that's in the boat with them. And that he's right there with them. He is present. And so what I think when Jesus says, you of little faith, what he's trying to say is the opposite is, a rock solid faith is a faith that is centered on the person of Jesus. Who he is, his promise to be with us, his power to enable us, whenever and whenever and wherever the storms in our lives occur. And I do the exact same thing all the time. Don't get so hard on these disciples. Some of the littlest, teeniest inconveniences, some of the littlest, teeniest circumstances come out of the blue and surprise me. And what's my first reaction? Deal with the circumstance. Oh my goodness. The circumstances, it came out of nowhere. What am I going to do? How am I going to react? How am I going to deal with this circumstance? And, and there's this little finger on my back. Reminder, I'm with you. Reminder, my presence and power are with you. 90% of the time, I ignore the finger patting me on the back. And so every single one of us, when our lives catch us by surprise or overwhelm us or when we can't control a circumstance, one of our first reactions is we become absolutely consumed with the circumstance. And we absolutely forget who's in the boat with us. This Jesus, who in one word was able to calm a storm. Douglas O'Donnell says this, 
When you think about this situation of the disciples in the boat, the boat in the storm, who of us wouldn't have become afraid? In such situations, it would be less than human for us not to be afraid. It's important to say that Jesus is not addressing fear as such, fear in the ordinary or necessary sense, but he is addressing what these disciples experienced as, from the Greek, excessive fear. They had become paralyzed with fear. It was a fear that pushes their faith in God and pushes it out the back door. Fear that doesn't recognize who's in control anyway. Fear that doesn't acknowledge who's on the boat with them. The disciples should have known something of Jesus' divine authority, enough of it to at least trust him even in the most extreme situation. That seems to be what is behind his question. Why are you afraid, O oh, you of little faith? I, although I don't think they should have seen the big picture, they, they should have at least seen who was sleeping on board and why he is able to sleep through such a storm. But instead here, they show little faith. Little faith in what? Little faith in Jesus. Other than faith in his ability to save them from drowning. For they do eventually wake him and cry out to him, Lord, save, we're going to be destroyed. Now what is interesting in this story, O'Donnell says, is that Jesus takes them right where they're at, and he'll take you right where you're at. Do you notice that the, Jesus doesn't say to them, Oh, you want me to do what? Well, I'm not stopping this storm until I see some real faith out of you. He doesn't do that. He takes them right where they're at. Doesn't say, wake me up again when your faith is stronger. You bunch of wimps. Jesus hears their plea, reminds them that faith during difficult circumstances is a form of courage. I would divine that type of faith that Jesus is expecting here as courageous confidence in who Jesus is. Courageous confidence in who Jesus is. And that he promises his strengthening presence no matter what storm we experience in life. This kind of faith is an absolute confidence in who Jesus is rather than freaking out over the circumstance I happen to be in. So here's my suggestion. And the thumbs pointing back here too, because this is a dilemma in my life. We all worry. We all become afraid. We all freak out. When those types of situations come into your life, one of the things that you need to do is put yourself in timeout. For those of you who don't understand, when we were parenting, one of the things you would do with a child who was not acting appropriately, among other things, was send them to timeout. And the purpose of the timeout was, you're going to sit there and you're going to think about what you just did. And you and I need to do the same thing. I see a lot of older parents looking at their adult children saying, yeah, you remember that, don't you? You and I need to do that when we're freaking out about something going on in our life. We need to back up, sit down. <sighs> yep, I'm afraid. I'm fearful. This came out of the blue. I have no control over it. <sighs> but who's in control? Who's in this boat with me? Who's sitting in this timeout right next to me? Jesus. I have the power and presence of Christ with me during this circumstance. There was a woman known as Perpetua, and she was born in the late second century A.D., and we have little understanding of who she is, how she came to Christ. But she was imprisoned for her faith. And during her time in prison, in those few days, her and another prisoner wrote a diary. 
And it's from that diary that we were able to understand what took place from the point that she was in prison on. Perpetua's courage and faith so impressed the famous preacher and theologian Augustine that he preached four sermons about her death. Perpetua was a very well-educated, noble woman who at the turn of the second century lived with her husband, her son, and her servant, Felicitas. They lived in Carthage, which is modern-day Tunisia in Africa. At this time, North Africa was the center of a vibrant Christian community. So it is no surprise that when the Roman emperor determined to eliminate Christianity at that time, because he believed it, quote, undermined Roman patriotism, end of quote, he focused his first attention of persecuting and eliminating Christians on North Africa. Among the first to be arrested was a group of Christians who were taking a class preparing to be baptized because they had just placed their faith in Jesus Christ. Among the first, one of those was the young woman, Perpetua. She was only 22 years old and had a newborn baby. In solidarity, Satyrus, another member who had not been arrested, turned himself in, saying, I want to be able to suffer alongside my brothers and sisters. While in prison, these new believers in Christ were baptized, and Perpetua's baptism was a deep source of encouragement for her. Perpetua's father immediately came to her in prison, and he was a non-believing pagan, and he believed that he had a very easy way for Perpetua to save her life. He admonished her, deny that you are a Christian. Father, she said, do you see this water pitcher that's in my prison cell? Could it be called anything else than a water pitcher? No, her father replied. Well, neither can I be called anything other than what I am. I am a follower of Christ. In the next days, Perpetua was relocated to a better part of the prison where she was allowed to nurse her newborn child. With her hearing approaching, her father visited one more time, pleading even more passionately, have pity on me, have pity on your mother, have pity on your siblings. If I have raised you to reach this prime in your life, do not abandon me. Think of your other family. Think of your child. Give up your pride. Give up your allegiance to Jesus. Perpetua was very moved by her father's emotional plea, but she remained unshaken. She replied to her father, it will all happen in prison just as God wills for it to happen. For you may be sure of this one thing. We are not left to ourselves, but we are all within his power. Did you hear that? We are not left to ourselves, but we are all in his power. Her father walked out of the prison completely dejected. The day of the trial arrived. Perpetua and her friends were marched before the Roman governor. Perpetua's friends were questioned first, and each one confessed to being a Christian. Each in turn refused to make a sacrifice to the emperor. The sacrifice was an act of worship and an act of allegiance towards the emperor. Then the governor turned to question Perpetua, and at that moment her father, once again carrying Perpetua's son in his arms, burst into the room. He grabbed Perpetua, pleaded, perform the sacrifice, perform the sacrifice, have pity at least on your baby. The Roman governor, probably wishing to avoid the unpleasantness of executing a woman with a newborn child, had her father beaten and removed from the area. And then the Roman emperor says, are you a Christian? To which Perpetua replied simply, yes, I am. So you will not offer a sacrifice to the emperor. To which she replied, no, I will not.
Perpetua, her friends, including her servant, Felicitas, who had come to know Christ through Perpetua, were led to the Colosseum. And when they entered the stadium, wild beasts and gladiators roamed the arena floor and the stands, and in the stands, crowds roared to see the blood of the Christians shed. They didn't have to wait long. One by one, these brothers and sisters in Christ were quickly slain by the sword. This is an extreme story, I will admit. This, this is extreme. But my point is, here you have an example of someone who's involved in a very extreme circumstance basically her life in the balance, leaving a newborn behind. And her response is, I will rely on Christ's presence and his power during this circumstance and whatever happens, happens. And I read this story to remind myself that most of the time my circumstances that I freak out about are infinitely more tiny than what Perpetua had to deal with. And yet, I still freak out. So the point of the story is, as the point of chapter 8 is, that Jesus has ultimate authority. But the promise is that this Jesus who has ultimate authority will always be present with you through any circumstance. Do you have that promise as an anchor? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for the reminder from your word this morning of, first of all, who Jesus is. Lord, that he is the King of kings and he is the Lord of lords. He is God in the flesh. And then also thank you for the reminder of his promise through this story that no matter what we're going through, that he is always present and always available for us. Lord, may we not forget, and may we live that truth and that reality. Not meaning that we're never going to be afraid, not meaning that we're never going to be anxious, but during those times, we can trust in your promises. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand with us. We're going to continue our worship. Thank you, Pastor. We're going to sing that great hymn, How Great Thou Art, in response to that.
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him. Praise God with morning's breaking light. Praise Him through darkness of the night. Praise Him with every breath of life. Praise Him, my soul. With the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us. Every moment, all our days, God be praised, oh God be praised. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us. Praise God when face to face we see the one who died to set us free. The one who rose in victory. Praise now forever. the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us. Every moment, all our days, God be praised, oh God be praised. Praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now with us. Every God be praised, oh God be praised. God be praised, oh God be praised. 
Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Hey, can we offer a thank you to our worship team? I mean, fantastic job every week, week after week, practicing during the week, get here early in the morning, and, and just help us to draw closer uh, to Christ. And can we give a thank you to a, a God who, even when we freak out, is compassionate and kind and patient and uses those times to teach us and to draw us closer to Him? Can we give our great God a hand as well? I love Psalm 46 because the, the writer gives us some extreme circumstances. He says, God is our refuge and God is our strength, a helper who is always found during times of trouble. Therefore, we will not be afraid. Though the earth were to tremble and though the mountains drop into the depths of the sea, though the waters roar, though the waters foam, though the mountains quake, and everything is in turmoil. There is a river. Its streams delight the city of God, the holy dwelling place of our Most High. God is within her. She will not be moved. God will help her when the morning dawns. The nations might rage. Kingdoms might topple. The earth melts when it hears God's voice. The Lord of armies is always with us. The God of Jacob is always a stronghold. May that be a promise that you anchor your lives into. Thank you for being here. Please greet one another as uh, you leave, especially those who you're not familiar with, but you are dismissed at this time. Have a great week. Thanks for being here. Sunday morning.